Welcome to another episode of The Dissection. Today we're going to have a conversation about the media, why the media is struggling, particularly the news media globally, but particularly in South Africa. There are three stories that I just want to zone in on to give you some information about developments that have been happening in the media. Number one, the South African National Editors Forum has called for an urgent regulation to protect struggling news media from artificial intelligent threats. So they're saying that they're facing a new challenge from AI technology, which, as you know, ChatGPT and other AIs which exist right now, developed by OpenAI, Google, even um, Elon Musk has an AI that he's been developing. And they're saying that this is threatening their web traffic and it's already dwindling their advertising revenue. They say that companies such as NVIDIA are able to grow and become more valuable around the world while actually they are threatening companies such as media companies, right? So what they're calling for is regulation, an urgent regulation. They're saying that big tech companies have undermined the news industry for too long and it's time for them to be held accountable. Further, this is what is being said. It cannot be business as usual. They cannot continue with practices that they do. They are damaging or refusing to accept the damage they have done to the sustainability of journalism and its entire ecosystem. And this is a rephrased quote from the executive director of the South African National Editors Forum, Reggie Mulawusi. So, so that's one story. The other story, and you've seen versions of this story um, being being reported on, is that multi-choice is failing. And as things stand right now, the group lost 9% of its base in its last uh, reporting, and it's down to 15.7 million subscribers. In South Africa, 400,000 people stopped paying for the service. And what they say is the reason for it is intense load shedding and high subscription prices, right? And then they also say that in the continent, they have lost 13% of their customer base, right? Ending at 8.1 million customers. And MultiChoice has really been making major losses for a long period of time. Many people have got different issues with DSTV, but we'll talk about all of that on the back end. Here's the third story. The third story is that Media24 is reporting that 400 jobs are at risk and it's closing print editions of five newspapers. Uh, the group has said that it's considering stopping print publications and selling community media portfolios and its media logistics business, right? The Media24 CEO, Ishmet Davidson, said that there have been decades of declines in advertising and circulation and that those declines have had a devastating impact on print publications, right? They want to add the publications of City Press, Bleed, Rapport, Daily Sun, and Soka La Duma, right? They're also going to stop um, the publication of digital editions of Folk's Blood and Die Burger, whose cup, I think my Africans is horrible. Actually, it's non-existent. So I probably cooked those names. Then they're selling their media logistics business on the dot and their community newspaper portfolio, right? So what the CEO said is that Media24 titles in the north of South Africa had been on life support in a while. He said that the combined losses are projected to amount to 200 million rand over the next three years. And that after years of cutbacks, they've reached the end of cost reductions to save these print operations. And he says they've run out of options. Right. So that is the, the framing uh, of this conversation for you to understand where we're going and what are my reflections on this particular issue. They are nine reasons that I've identified, and I'm going to go into some of them as to why print media is dying, why the news in and of itself is dying in South Africa. Number one, social media has become a source for news. Number two, podcasts and YouTube have become a source for news and discourse. Number three, there's a lack of investment in talent. Number four, and this, this is one I'm going to actually start with, there have been biased narratives which have created a lack of trust. 
Number five, there's been a focus on elite narratives. Number six, there's been a lack of innovation. Number seven, there's been a disjointed payment structure. Number eight, oligopoly. Oligopoly. It always shows up when you start to see businesses failing. And number nine, that artificial intelligence question. But I think they're actually being mischievous and misleading about the artificial intelligence. But we'll get to that when, when, I, when I get there. Guys, before we go on, if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. But 86% of the people watching this video haven't subscribed to the channel. The channel subscription helps YouTube know that you love this content. You love the algorithm. We're approaching 15,000 uh, subscriptions right now. Truly, truly grateful to everyone who subscribed. Truly, truly grateful to everyone who is making comments and participating in the conversation. I see you. I respect you. Thank you so much for your engagement. Let's go now to why I think that the media is dying. Number one, bias narratives. Bias narratives. Bias narratives. If you're biased for too long, people no longer come to your shop. If you provide poor quality of service, people no longer come to your shop. You know, for very long, we have seen the media be factional in South Africa. We've seen the media be dishonest at times in South Africa, and that has caused issues. Let me give you a very recent example of media bias. In this 2024 election, the media took a position against the MK party. We saw ENCA, they were supposed to do a live um, screening of the Jacob Zuma interview with um, JJ Tabani, Professor JJ Tabani. That interview was supposed to happen on Sunday, a full 72 hours before the election on Wednesday. The interview was advertised by the channel. And at some point, there was a decision made that, no, we're not going to run with this. And it was moved. And the story that was told was that it's going to be a pre-record. A, a pre -record. They did the pre-record. It was supposed to show on the Monday. They then said, and it was still being advertised, and they said, no, we're going to violate the code because you need to be within 48 hours. That's what they said. Then... When it was now, you, then then they didn't air the interview. Of course, there was a Tabo Mbegi interview aired that very same night on a different channel, showing that the adherence to this particular principle was not consistent and that, you know, they could have actually aired the interview because uh, we saw that Newsroom Africa aired the Tabo Mbegi interview. Tabo Mbegi was very explicit that he's campaigning for the, uh, the ANC. It was explicit. So it was going to be, in a degree, a campaign interview. That inconsistency, that's the kind of thing that showed bias. It's the kind of thing that showed that, hey, in a particular segment of media, there's no favorability for this particular party. The media has a role to cover and inform the public fully. It's the public's choice to then say, we don't like this particular party. We like that particular party. They fail to do that. Then they say that the media, the, the interview would then be showed at a later time, right? Today is the 22nd of June. The elections ended on the 29th of May. So we are three weeks into the post-election period. Where is that interview? That's an example. Another example is the coverage of um, the stories around Palapala versus the stories around VBS, Gupta Leaks. If you look at how the media operated with the VBS bank heist, number one, they focused on the EFF. There are people who are going to trial right now. There are people who are municipal leaders, who are politicians, who are business leaders in the Limpopo province who participated in the looting of the money of the grannies, the money of the people who were investing in this mutual bank, right? Those people, if I were to ask you right now, I'm going to just pause for a second and ask you, name them. Name the people who are right now facing trial for VBS bank heist. Name five. One, two, three, four. Do you have do you have those names? Five. You don't know them because the media did not make them famous. The media did not make them famous. They spent a lot of time on the EFF. The EFF is accused of benefiting 16 million rands. 16 million rands is a lot of money. The amount of money that was stolen is over two billion. So you saw charts, you saw graphs, you saw those spider web thingies. You know the spider web thingies where they show you the like, yeah, 
other people who got the money from the thing. And then you see the threads of the spider web going to the face of Julius Malema, the face of Floyd Shivambo, the face of, of Brian Shivambo, the face of anybody else that they've identified. You saw that. Crafts on crafts on crafts. Right now, News 24 is doing this series called uh, Paul Mashatile Unmasked. It's unmasked. He's got no mask on now, Paul. You can see him clearly because of News 24. All kinds of journalism around that. But with Palapala, what about Palapala? Why haven't you seen the same level of scrutiny, of attention? When Jacob Zuma was the president, Gupta leaks happened. Gupta leaks happened. They knew that there were various laws that were being violated here, but they were like, we're going to protect the whistleblower. We're now, brr, 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 blow the whistle. <laughs> and it's good. It's good to hold uh, leaders accountable, but it's also important to do so consistently across the board. That inconsistency has led to a lack of trust. That lack of trust, because at the beginning, if someone doesn't uh, is not happy with what they're seeing, they'll come in, they'll observe that, oh, okay, this thing is a little bit biased, okay, but I think they're still doing good work here, here, and there. You know, then they'll come back again. But if you keep doing it day after day after day after day, they're not going to come back anymore. They're going to go to other places for their news. And I think more than anything, biased narratives created a lack of media trust. And that lack of media trust is what led to a loss of audience. Once you begin to lose audience at a critical level, then you're going to lose advertising revenue. Then you're going to lose any other revenue. Then people are going to stop looking for your publication on a Sunday. I've actually noticed when I go to the garage, maybe, or the supermarket on Sundays, all my life, um, you know, I've lived with people who read Sunday newspapers, right? My father used to read them. My uncle used to read them. And it was a tradition that you would go get all the Sunday newspapers, you know, uh, City Press, you get Sunday Times, you get Sunday World, you get uh, anything. And then you sit there all, all morning going over the news, talking about the news. Now, when you go to the same garages, because I used to be the one, you know, when you're younger, they send you, right? To Mamina, that's what used to happen. And involuntarily, because I didn't want to be sent, but they would send me. And now you see that they, where there used to be 50 of those papers, now there's 20. Now there's 15. Now sometimes you can't even find some publications in some garages. Some garages don't even sell newspapers anymore. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's not every garage anymore that you can get newspapers from. This is because of this lack of trust. There are so many examples. You know, uh, Amapungane, Ground Up, all of these, these investigative platforms, they, they actually told us a lot, even about Tabo Best. Wow, what a great story. Where is the investigative journalism for Palapal? Where is the investigative journalism for Glencore? Let me use Glencore as another interesting example. Glencore, this big mining company, right? Uh, big all around the world. Jiggy Jiggy, we find out that Glencore is paying fines in the USA, right? They're also paying fines in the, the United Kingdom. Large amounts of fines, billions of foreign currency dollars, right? That they are paying. Not billions of rands, billions of forex. What were they paying the fines for? Do you remember? Do you want to take a guess? For corruption in Africa. Two types of corruption. One, manipulation of pricing, commodity pricing. Number two, bribing African politicians. Can you imagine this naughty, naughty company? Hey, we're not. Glencoe, Kangile. Kangile, we're not Glencoe. Imagine that. Who were you supposed to hear that story from first? The UK or America or Africa. You mean to tell me that this company was bribing African politicians, manipulating the prices of commodities, and no African journalist picked it up? Not even like one, one Susan, one Chablani, nothing. Nothing, not, not even one. One Marianne, one Natasha, one Karen, nothing. Nobody. You mean to tell me that reasonably we can conclude that with all of these excellent investigative journalists, nobody at all thought, hey, is this company doing good things in this country or is it just holy? It's a holy company. Part of the reason why they never wanted to look 
is because that company was associated with very senior politicians who are governing right now. That's why they didn't want to look. That's why they didn't want to examine. But with Guptas, they wanted to look. That's bias. That's bias, right? Those kind of things lead to, lead to lack of trust, right? Let, let me go through the other ones. Because of this lack of trust, then you started having people go into social media for news. Then you started having them going to TikTok. As more and more people went to these places, of course, advertisers are going to see that you don't have numbers. There's numbers on X, there's numbers on Instagram, there's numbers on TikTok, there's numbers on these other places. They're going to put their adverts there because it's cheaper. It's cheaper than paying news. Newspapers overcharge for adverts. Even now, if you wanted to advertise as a small business, they're going to kill you. They're going to really make it difficult for you to be able to advertise on their platform. Even that is a sign of a problem. The other side of the equation is that podcasters and YouTube also became a source for news. And these are people who didn't find expression in these media publications. They were overlooked for historical talent and gate. there was a lot of gatekeeping. So instead of the media houses going to find these young people and say, hey, we see you're doing great things on the internet. Come through, come through, work for us. They didn't do that, right? So that affected them. Lack of investment in talent, same thing. These media houses have not made it um, lucrative for people to stay in journalism. So a lot of people who work in journalism eventually leave and become, you know, government spokespersons, that kind of thing. Even the fact that that becomes its own career path makes those people very soft on government officials because I need that job. So when I do interviews now of, of uh, ministers, government departments, I'm not going to be hard on them because they could be my future employer. That's my come up. That's how I'm going to level up. And that in and of itself also weakens the, the, the lens of scrutiny that the media is supposed to give. Another reason why they've struggled is because they focused on elite issues. They just wanted to talk about the issues that worry Santon, the issues that worry Seapoint, the issues that worry Umklanga Rocks. People want to hear about the issues that affect the rural areas. They want to hear about the issues that are affecting the townships. They want to hear about what are the gangsters in the townships up to? Who are those people? Hold those people to account. Every other story is about the markets, about this, this, all of these things which affect the elites and not the people on the streets. And if you keep speaking to the elites and not the people on the streets, how can you be confused that the people on the streets are not coming to support your business? They're not actually becoming an audience for you. That's why you'll find publications like Daily Maverick have got very, very low readership when you think about, if you compare Daily Maverick to, to Mac G, Mac G has got a much bigger platform than Daily Maverick because they don't actually um, you know, cater to the issues that affect the people on the ground in a way that they can actually say, let me go to these publications to get information. The other one is that there was simply a lack of innovation. There was a lack of innovation. They saw these changes. These changes didn't start in 2024. They started long ago. Many other media publications were able to respond proactively to these things, but these companies failed to do. If you look at New York Times, they were able to really become strong in the podcast game. They are one of the leading companies in podcasting. They were able to really make sure that they figure out a lot of the dynamics of operating a digital business. The, the case studies for how to survive in the digital age, in the social media age, are multiple. And these companies have failed to do that. The other thing is that they've got a disjointed payment structure. If you try to really support local media, let's say you want to support News24, Mail and Guardian, uh, Times Live, and all of these, each of them is charging 80 rand, 90 rand, 100 rand. That's a lot of money. That's more than Netflix. Huh? More than Netflix for the news. Get out of here, man. Get out of here for real, man. That's an example of just failure to be aware of your market and how to create effective solutions. They were supposed to create one payment structure for these particular interventions and then split the money based on uh, some kind of a model that works. The fact that they couldn't collaborate, make things easy, is on them, right? The other thing is that in oligopoly, right, the media space in South Africa is an oligopoly. Naspers, that, the company that owns Media24, dominates everything. Then you've got Rupert owning ENCA and a few other publications. You don't have space in the media for real competition. And there hasn't been a lot of support. You know, they don't give me uh, uh, loans to companies that are coming up trying to build uh, media alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. So what that has done is created lack of competition. Lack of competition leads to lack of innovation. Oligopoly always shows you market failures. It doesn't lead to an improvement in quality of service. It often leads to a decline in quality of service. And that's something that applies to these media houses as well.
I want to finish off by artificial intelligence. I actually think that they are blaming artificial intelligence, but they really want to use artificial intelligence. These layoffs, the 400 layoffs, are because the media houses realize that they no longer need to be print because less and less people are on print, more and more people are on digital, right? But they hire all of these journalists. They have all of these logistics to deliver these newspapers all over the place. They don't need that. They want to blame artificial intelligence while using artificial intelligence. In the coming years, many of the stories that you will read in all of these media publications will be written by AI. That means one journalist can now do 10 more stories than they could do a day, right? That means the trusted journalists, the senior journalists in some of these publications will be controlling more and more of the narrative while other journalists are now no longer able to pursue that profession. I don't think that artificial intelligence as things are right now is the reason why these uh, newspaper articles are not doing well, right? They're saying that because it provides summaries of stories, etc. Let's be real. Adoption of artificial intelligence in South Africa is not very high at this particular moment. And also in Africa, it's not very high as well. They charge for these things, Boma Chat, GPT, all of that. It's not free, that stuff. You can get uh, GPT 3.5 for free, but there's limited stuff you can do with it. The real GPT is 4 and 4.0. You have to pay money for them. People don't want to be paying no 200 rands for a chat GPT. Let's be honest. That's how much it costs, I think, uh, give or take. So th this artificial intelligence story to me seems uh, uh, to be to be uh, one that is um, fabricated or really being used to gaslight the audience. Not fabricated, but gaslighting the audience. They want to use artificial intelligence, but they come and they say artificial intelligence is killing uh, the media business when they're the ones who want to use the, the artificial intelligence. I don't buy that artificial intelligence story. So I want to conclude by saying we do need good journalism. We do need investment in stories. We do need voices that are independent. But I don't think that they're going to come from traditional media anymore. Traditional media has chosen sides. It has chosen focus. It has chosen where it's going to be. I think it's going to be platforms like SMWX, like MJTV, that are going to really be the ones that try to do some of this analytical work, which you can't find anymore in mainstream media. I don't think it's going to come from mainstream. So I'm going to finish off by saying, if you haven't subscribed to channels such as this one, please do check out all the YouTube channels creating great content. Some of them will have a shift to this side, some of them to another side. But I think, you know, right now, it's, it's something that we need to do because we've seen that the media is not always going to tell the full story, the whole story and the truth and nothing but the truth. So help them. They're not going to do that. We're going to need platforms like these ones. So I, 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 I'm asking you, Give us a subscription. We really appreciate it. Let YouTube know you appreciate the algorithm. But I want to ask you as well, what do you think is causing this decline in media? Are you happy with the quality of journalism in South Africa? Are you happy with the quality of TV journalism in South Africa? Or do you have concerns? If you have concerns, what are those concerns? Let's have a conversation. Don't forget, comment, like, subscribe. Till the next one.